You see there on the paper, uh, understanding the seven seals of God's judgment, and you see Revelation 6 and Matthew 24. Guess what? You have Revelation 6, the verses are printed here. So where do I want you to turn in your Bibles? Matthew 24, very good. Uh, about two years ago, uh, Bob, was, Bob and Angie were gone to Honduras, and I was filling in in the care and share class, and I shared this lesson uh, in the care and share class about two years ago, so, so it may be familiar uh, to some of you. This is probably my favorite lesson to teach of anything in the Bible. Uh, it's uh, And whenever I discovered and saw how the symbols of the book of Revelation parallel with one of Jesus' sermons, uh, it, just, it just opened up my eyes to new things. So again, this is one of my favorite uh, lessons uh, to teach in a classroom setting. So I am thrilled uh, that you're here uh, tonight. Uh, whenever we look at the book of Revelation, and matter of fact, even beginning in, in verse number 1 of Revelation 6, uh, all of the symbolism, it, it sounds so heavy, doesn't it? I'm going to read those first two verses in Revelation 6, and in a little bit, we're going to be looking in our Bibles to Matthew 24. John writes, And when I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard, as it were, the voice of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, I want, to, uh, I want us to understand something here. This is not a pretty picture. Whenever we see a rider on a white horse, uh, uh, we tend to think that white is that color of purity and peace, but that's not the case here. It's not the case here at all. It is a picture of false peace. It is a picture of false hope. And it is a picture of a false Christ. Now, if you were here in our lesson last week, as I shared with you out of Revelation chapter 5, all of a sudden there was this document that shows up in chapter 5. It was a sealed letter with seven seals on it. And that meant it was like the provisions of a Roman will. And, and uh, you would have to take off the seals one at a time to find out what was contained in that document. And only the person of high authority to whom the document was sent was worthy to open the seals. And so they were looking all over heaven and all over earth. None of the angels in heaven were worthy of opening the seals, and none of the people presently on earth was worthy of opening the seals, and the 24 elders that had already been given their positions on their thrones in Revelation 4, none of them were worthy to open the seals. And finally, they saw a lamb, a lamb that look, looked as if it had been slain, and he was worthy to open the seals. And it was described that, that this one was the root of David. So he was the one from whom King David got his existence. And yet in other passages of scripture, we see that Jesus is referred to as the son of David. And, and I find that just a wonderful parallel. Uh, Jesus was at the right hand of the Father when the world was created, and he was the foundation for David's existence. But yet, 28 generations after David served as king, Jesus came to earth to live as our Messiah. And so he was the root of David, so the very foundation of David's existence, but he was also the son of David. But now, this one who has opened the seals, he's opened the first seal to the document. And they have read 
part of the letter. And that first seal, it represents a false peace. Because the one that's riding on the horse, he has a crown, but I want to point out something real quick. Have you noticed how often I've mentioned crowns here in the book of Revelation? It's going to be about chapter 19 before we see a crown that in the Greek it's referred to as the diadema, which means the kingly crown. So it's going to be a long time before we see one of those crowns. In this case, it's a Stephanos crown, so it can refer to a soldier who has come back victorious from war. And so the one who is sitting on this white horse, he's only wearing a Stephanos crown. So in other words, any of his power that he received, he received it at the expense of others. Okay, does that make sense? So this false Christ, anything that he does, it's at the expense of others. And he's going forth conquering and to conquer. Now, I want to give you a prelude of something that won't come forward for another two or three lessons. But I want to say this now. The Antichrist is Satan's great imitation. And uh, we often in the Bible refer to the Godhead as the Trinity, right? Even though the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, uh, uh, Satan has an imitation uh, for everything that God tries to do. And Satan even has created a false Trinity. So the Antichrist is his false Christ. And the false prophet that we'll study about sometimes later is the false Holy Spirit. And Satan is trying to set up himself as God being the third person in the false trinity. So we will deal with that a whole lot more uh, in future lessons, but it's important to introduce it now. So I said to you that I wanted you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, I, I want to begin at verse 3, even though I want you to focus on verses 4 and 5. It says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and when will the sign of your coming be and the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. So, now notice this. So, verse, uh, uh, verses 1 and 2 of Revelation 6 says that there was this rider on a white horse and he was conquering people. He was gaining his dominion at the expense of others, right? Right? And now Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5, don't be deceived because in the latter days there's going to be many, many that come in my name and they will deceive many. And, he, and, and then uh, uh, we shouldn't be surprised. Has that happened in our lifetime? It's happened so much. Matter of fact, uh, uh, a lot of you who are younger will not remember this name, but, uh, but many who are my age or older will. Do you remember Sun Young Moon? You remember him? And his followers were called the Moonies. And, uh, and you'll remember that he made a big, big splash in the world. Uh, his empire was not so great in the United States, even though that's where he encompassed most of his money. You'll remember that he would brainwash, he would get people, and in some cases he would get kids who were down on, the, on their luck, even drug addicts. He would brainwash them, and then he would send them into shopping malls and airports to collect money for his organization. He was a false Christ, and, and he even said that he was the third Adam. 
You remember in the Bible it talks about the second Adam? The second Adam is Jesus. But Sun Yun Moon said that Jesus failed because he never had any offspring. And Sun Yun Moon had had kids, and so because of that, he was the third Adam. So he accomplished what Jesus did not. And a lot of people worldwide bought into his teaching that he was the third Adam. And, and, but he was not the Antichrist. He was just one of the many false Christs. He raised billions and billions of dollars, or actually a uh, uh, dollar to five dollars at a time, his followers in airports and shopping malls would solicit people for money. And finally, what shut his cult down near the end of his life, the United States finally got him on tax evasion. And whenever they shut down his money revenues, all of his followers of all levels left him. And... and there's not even such a thing. You don't even hear of anybody following that doctrine anymore. And, and so it, it's, it's an amazing thing. But many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. Did you know that in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, there were more cults that formed than at any other time? You know, they, they, they believed a portion of the Bible, but they kept changing it a little bit. And, and yet, uh, yet, we see a lot of that happening today, but what we see happening today is in the hearts and minds of people. Uh, this, these false teachings have infiltrated our government and, and things of this nature. But, but anyway, many will come in the latter day saying, hey, I'm the Christ. I'm the anointed one, and they will deceive many. So let's look on your handout uh, at the second seal. The scripture's right there. Follow with me as I read. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse, and this horse was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. All right, immediately we're gonna to go to, to Matthew chapter 24, verse six. Jesus said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Now, the second seal was you start hearing about wars more frequently. Now, just the fact that there was a war someplace, that's not an alarming thought that the end might be coming. But in many of our lifetimes, uh, well, in the 1900s, for the first time, there was five wars that went worldwide or that involved armies from every continent, okay? World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnamese War, and the Gulf War, and then also uh, early in the uh, uh, 2000s, we also know that we had a second Iraqi war. But, uh, but anyway, those are the only wars that have impacted every single continent. And so Jesus said, hey, you're going to hear about wars. And I like the way the King James Version puts it. Jesus said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you be not troubled for the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And he goes on, and because of that, there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers' manners or in various manners. There'll be earthquakes in various places. So he tells us in verse 8 of Matthew 24, all of these things are just the beginning of sorrows. 
So this is the time when, when things are ultimately sorrowful. And so we can see just from the first two seals that we've already uh, uh, discussed, we can see the progression there. And doesn't it already fit perfectly with Matthew 24? And now, I'm going to tell you why that gives me comfort. The words of Jesus are a whole lot easier to understand than the vision of John. Right? We read the words of Jesus and, and we say, okay, I get that. Well, to know that John in his vision uh, was shown some things in a visual manner that Jesus had described in Matthew 24. And by the way, John would have been present at that sermon. So don't you know that to some degree it would have connected the dots with him as well? All right, any comments or any questions any of you have? Let's move on to the third seal. Revelation 5 and 6. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see, thou not hurt the oil and the wine. Now, uh, the third beast, or, or the third seal, rather, represents famine. I've already shared with you uh, uh, Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8. Uh, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and because of that, uh, the Bible says in the latter days there will be earthquakes and pestilence, or there will be pestilence and famine and earthquakes in various places. So uh, uh, what follows war? If you've studied your history books, what follows war? Famine. Famine. So, so it all makes sense, doesn't it? And with that horrific war, uh, uh, you know, one of the bad things, uh, uh, one of the good things about television news is that you get information. One of the bad things is you see the devastation of our earth and, uh, and all the terrible things that have gone on uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the awful, awful things that continue to go on there and they are already experiencing famine from their war. So, uh, so a war ravages the land and the black horse, the rider is carrying a pair of balances. Uh, so so uh, uh, the pair of balances is to measure something, right? It's to measure something. It's, the, uh, it's for the purpose of measuring or rationing food. Now, uh, uh, I'm made to think, I, 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 know that, uh, I know that Bob has heard Stan Toller speak. Uh, I had the privilege of, of developing a close, close relationship with Stan Toller. He was a conference speaker that traveled around the, the country, and he ended up, uh, he was Nazarene by denomination. He ended up being the executive director of their denomination, uh, for the last few years of his life. Uh, he was only a few years older than I am, but uh, he got cancer and, and he passed away. But uh, his story is a story of tragedy, almost from beginning to end. But yet, to talk to the guy, you would never know it. He was one of the happiest, most positive guys you could ever meet. Right, Bob? I mean, he was extremely positive. Uh, and uh, he tells this story, and I've heard it more than once. I've heard him tell it when he was preaching, and I've heard, it tell it, I heard him tell it on, on uh, whenever he would be doing conferences. And he tells this story about how his, fan, his dad was a coal miner in West Virginia. And they, uh, because uh, the health and the conditions were so bad there, uh, by faith, his family decided to move to Ohio. And, uh, and they went to Ohio, and the job market was at its worst. 
And, uh, and anyway, some of you will remember, you used to could, uh, uh, the government would give out cheese in certain locations, and you remember? Well, uh, it was Christmas Eve, and Stan tells the story about his uh, dad and him going down to see if they can get some cheese from the government so they could eat on Christmas Eve. Now, can you imagine that? So they could eat on Christmas Eve. And so uh, they stood in line for well over two hours, and uh, finally his dad said, Stan, let's go. And Stan was 10 years old. He said, uh, Stan, let's go. He said, God will provide. And uh, they get home, and they're wondering what they're going to do about their meal. And there was a knock on the door in the church that they had started attending. And they'd only attended there a few months. Members of that church showed up, and, and they had baskets of food and gifts for the three boys. And, and God did provide. Well, I want you to understand something. It was the church that provided for the Toller family. In the great tribulation, when things get at their worst, I believe the church will be rescued prior to that. Can you imagine the famine that's going to be in the land? People are going to be fighting over food. I remember a song back in the 70s that was popular, and, and some of you will remember the lyrics. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. And it goes on to say, a piece of bread would buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. And that was about this passage of Scripture. That was about this passage of Scripture. So famine follows war. All right, let's look at the fourth seal. Any questions, by the way, before we move on? The fourth seal, beginning in verse 7 of Revelation 6. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell, or Hades, followed him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. So the pale horse represents death. Now, when war gets bad enough, it produces famine. And whenever famine gets bad enough, it'll even induce uh, all sorts of sicknesses and diseases. And uh, uh, for example, uh, if a land has been ravaged by war, the people have to rebuild. And sometimes that process of rebuilding, it, it takes a toll. Many more lives are lost as a result of the sicknesses uh, that ensue as a result of, of wartime. So the pale horse represents death. So after the wars uh, and famines have taken their toll on human life, one-fourth of the geographic earth will be affected. So now, I want to stop just for a second. Uh, we have missionaries that we support in Africa. And the pictures we saw last June from Africa... Uh, uh, we saw uh, it's an area they don't have adequate running water uh, uh, and, and disease is rampant on the continent of Africa and it's also rampant on the continent of uh, South America and if you add the geographic size of those two continents together that represents over one quarter geographically of the world. And so just by looking at some of the normalcies that go on in those two continents alone, if there is an area of our world that is ravaged by war, we can easily see how over a period of time 
how it could uh, create a famine that adds to the deaths even after the war has stopped. Right? Doesn't that make sense? And again, we're still cross-referencing uh, verses 6, 7, and 8 of Matthew 24. Uh, I, I want to repeat it to you again because they're, they're the key verses, I think, in this lesson. Uh, uh, Jesus said after the false Christ he said you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars see that you be not troubled for the end is not yet for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places and we're taught all of these are the beginning of sorrows alright knowing the famines that are already in our world today it's pretty easy to conceive 1.3 billion people dying from hunger and disease, isn't it? it it's, we're at a place in our world today, we can conceive that. We really can. Uh, well, and, and, and I, I, uh, 1.3 billion, it might be closer to 1.5 billion now. But anyway, any comments that you have? Well, thank goodness there's only four riders on those horses. Because none of those riders brought any good news whatsoever, did they? There was not any good news in any of the first four seals. Uh, hopefully, before we go too much further tonight, we'll begin seeing some hope. Let's look at the fifth seal. Now, in reading this, this sounds discouraging, but it's not. And when he had opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren, that they that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now, the good news. There were people in the latter days, or there are people in the latter days, still dying for the cause of Jesus Christ still dying uh, for the cause of Jesus Christ. Uh, our team leader, whenever we went to Honduras, Buck, uh, his daughter was personally engaged or personally closely affiliated with several individuals or numerous individuals who were killed in Afghanistan for their faith in recent years. So there are still people that are dying for the cause of Christ. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie The End of the Spear. Uh, and and uh, there, there was a couple that went as missionaries with their children. And I believe that area was, those of you who remember, wasn't it in South America somewhere? Where? Ecuador, thank you, thank you. And, uh, and so they went... And um, they were trying to distribute food and, and anyway, the father of these kids uh, was killed by, uh, by some of the natives that didn't know English. He, he was just killed. And years later, his son went back into that area and it took him a while to figure it all out. But he ended up evangelizing the very man who murdered his father. Ended up evangelizing the very man who murdered his father. Ended up loading the man on a plane and bringing him to America. And there are still people in our world today that are dying for the cause of Christ. And we're going to get to that a little bit more in just a little, little later. Let's look at the sixth seal. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I left out our cross reference in Matthew, didn't I? Look at verses 8 and 9. 
All of these are the beginning of birth pains or sorrows. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Now, isn't it amazing? You know, God knew what he was doing when he inspired people to write down the word of God. And this story fits perfectly with Jesus' sermon on the Mount of Olives. And, and I, I find that amazing. The sixth seal. If you're following with me, uh, it, it actually will conclude the book of Revelation chapter 6, uh, verse 12. And I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken by a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men uh, and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Now, you open the sixth seal and there was another earthquake. By the way, did you know that prior to the 18, 1800s, about 1850, that earthquakes were extremely rare? Now, I know that we have technology where we can let everybody know when there's been an earthquake, but earthquakes were considered very rare prior to 1850. And we hear about numerous, if you want to look for them, you can hear about numerous earthquakes every single month, right? Matter of fact, uh, my father-in-law has been gone since 1996. And in the last five years of his life, for uh, one of his hobbies, is he was charting earthquakes. And so that was one of his hobbies. He would chart earthquakes. He would do research on how often earthquakes were. And, and all of it had to do with this passage of Scripture. And so, uh, so I find that very interesting that, that Jesus made the statements that in the latter days that there will be earthquakes in various places. So there will be a more frequency of earthquakes. Uh, by the way, I chose Matthew 24 for our cross-references. Uh, in case you want to know... Uh, the, the book of Mark, chapter 13, is the same sermon. Now, Mark might would write in a slightly different, you know, some things would be more important to Mark than was to Matthew. Or Luke 21. So, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, all of those are the... Uh, uh, what, what Bible scholars call the Mount Olivet Discourse or the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. Okay? Now, here's the thing I want you to know about that. In Luke 21, Matthew doesn't point this out, but in Luke 21, verses 25 through 28, uh, uh, Jesus said that we would see signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars and with seas and waves roaring. And, and I believe that whenever, you know, the waves have roared ever since they're, you know, ever since they've been flowing, right? If you go to the ocean, you're used to seeing the seas roar. But it's referring to with great perplexity. So uh, uh, greater storms, uh, more earthquakes. And so an earthquake uh, uh, under the seas creates a tsunami. And, and, and so, uh, so we see all of that, and, and that was prophesied by Jesus in Luke 21. In Mark 13, Mark's the one that talks about untimely figs. So again, this parallels perfectly. So uh, uh, in, this, uh, in, re in verses 12 through 17 of Revelation 6, four catastrophes are mentioned. 
earthquakes, the eclipse of the sun, the moon turning to blood due to a lack of sunshine. And some Christian scientists have even suggested that hydrogen and nuclear explosions could cause this. And then, of course, falling stars or meteors. All right? Now, uh, I shared with you last week that we read uh, in Revelation 4.1 that John says, After this, I looked. Right? And at the time that we were about to find out about the scroll, John hears the voice and it sounded like a trumpet. So that's Revelation 4, 1. And I told you that uh, that is the place that some Bible scholars or many Bible scholars believe is referencing a possible time of the rapture. All right? In this passage of scripture, in, in uh, Revelation 6, all oh, about verse 16 or 17, uh, oh, I'm sorry, probably about 15, it says, even as a fig cast her untimely figs when she is shaken by a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll. So there are other Bible scholars who believe that that's talking about the, the rapture there. Okay? Just so you know, we'll cover that a little bit. We're going to cover timetables a little bit more on a review. But, but I just wanted you to know, some, and, and in both cases, uh, a noteworthy and legitimate Bible scholar. So I, I just want to point that out to you. Any questions any of you have? All right. Now, turn with me to Revelation 7. And believe it or not, we are well over halfway done uh, uh, with this lesson, even though we've got a chapter to go. And uh, uh, we're not going to read every verse of chapter 7 like we did in chapter 6, but um, there's something really exciting to me about uh, the seventh seal. Because we hadn't heard about the seventh seal. We've only, uh, chapter 6 only listed six seals, right? So it says, after this, I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. So when have you heard about winds being held back? In the Bible. Red Sea. Red Sea, right. Now, in the case of the Red Sea, that was right after 10 plagues. And now we see the wind being held back before the greatest of the plagues. But I, I find that interesting. And, and, and by the way, I, I've, I've said this, I've shared this in a sermon, I've shared this in a lesson before. Uh, uh, I thought God outdid himself uh, uh, about four or five years ago when outside of Tampa, uh, Florida, uh, one of the hurricanes, the wind got so much that it, uh, it backed up the ocean and stood the ocean up about three miles out and people were walking out on the bed of the ocean and there were all sorts of civil defense people saying, you gotta get back, the ocean's gonna be back anytime. Well, you know what, in our lifetime, we shouldn't be surprised that God could divide the Red Sea. We shouldn't be surprised that he could hold back the wind in Revelation 7. We shouldn't be surprised of any of this because he's recently showed us in our lifetime that, uh, that it can be done again. And, and, and so I find that encouraging and exciting. So uh, uh, it says in verse 2 of Revelation 7, then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given uh, power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now, look at verse 3 again. So, 
John is writing that the angels are instructed by God, don't, don't do anything, don't send any of the plagues yet until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And he says, then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. I told you uh, that in the 1800s, late 1800s, many cults were established that are still in operation today. One of those cults was the Jehovah's Witnesses. And you probably have had some Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door. Uh, if you are younger than I am, uh, you probably, uh, uh, whenever I was a little boy, the Jehovah's Witnesses said, we're the 144,000 spoken of in Revelation 7. Well, finally, the Jehovah's Witnesses got to where they had more converts than 144,000. And so they changed all their doctrine. And they changed it to where you had to be one of the elite Jehovah's Witnesses. And they began teaching differently. So they began changing what was already a false adaptation of the Bible. And uh, whenever all of this was new information, one Sunday afternoon, I had a couple of gentlemen come to see me. An older gentleman and uh, a gentleman that was in his 20s. He was about my age. And so they were talking, and I thought, I'm going to be a lot better off if I'm the one asking the questions instead of them. And so I began asking the questions. And so, uh, so anyway, I had recently heard that the Jehovah's Witnesses had changed their doctrine about the 144,000. And so I asked the man, I said, are you one of the 144,000? And he hung his head and he said, no. He said, I'm not one of the enlightened ones. And so he began sharing. He said, I'll just... You know, I'll have to be in the lower heaven. He said, you know, or, or on, on paradise earth. He said, I, I, no, I'm not one of the 144,000. I said, oh, what a shame. And, and so I began talking to him, and I was telling him that I was one of the anointed ones. And, and, and so we were talking and going back and forth, and he was arguing with me a little bit, and I began sharing stories about God's grace and, and I would share things that he couldn't really deny. And finally, I, I said something, and the younger man said, well, I thought that was the God I was serving. And immediately, the man said, well, come on, we better go. And I practically was chasing them out of the house, trying to get them to come back. The man was under incredible conviction. He said, I thought that was the God that I was serving. You know, and I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. I've tried some of those methods since then. It hasn't worked as well. But, uh, and I'll tell you one other thing real quickly in case you're ever cornered. I know most of you shut your doors and say, no, thank you, I'm not interested and there's a passage in John's writings in his letters that says that's a safe thing to do, so that's okay. But, uh, but I, I want you to know that if you're ever cornered and can't get your door shut quick enough, the Jehovah's Witness predicted that Jesus would come back in 1907. Did he come back in 1907? No. They predicted Jesus would come back in 1914. Did he come back in 1914? And so then they changed their doctrine in 1920 and they said Jesus came back in 1920 invisibly. And yet the Bible says that we will see him. Right? But uh, anyway, whenever I get to this passage of scripture, a lot of people who are my age or older think about the Jehovah's Witnesses calling themselves 144,000. 
Linda texted me earlier today. Linda Hoppe texted me earlier today. And I, I'm, I'm sure that your question had to do with this lesson, this scripture today, didn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it had to do with the, um, uh, are, are there Jews who know, like Jews in Israel, who know what tribe they're from? And, and we have to remember that the Jews, as a part of prophecy, were scattered all over the world. And God began calling them back. There were hundreds of years that, that Israel was not a nation. And then in 1948, Israel became a nation again, a strong nation. And, and I shared with Linda that, I, that quite probably there are some Jews who know what tribe they're from, but how difficult that that would be to, to, to really grasp but, but here we see the 12 tribes listed, and there were 12,000 from each of the tribes. And, and the question I had always wondered for years, who could the 144,000 be? I've got a strong opinion, and since I developed my opinion, I have found that I'm not alone in this opinion. We've already shared with you that either in Revelation 4, verses 1 and 2, or in Revelation 6, that we see the rapture of the church, right? So either way you look at it, the rapture of the church has just happened. The church has been rescued away and, and has been saved to where we don't have to go through the tribulation. Then, here's an interesting thing. Who rejected Jesus? The Jews rejected Jesus. The Jews rejected Jesus, and yet we find out through many of Paul's writings and, and some of the other writers that they were still God's remnant. Right? That, that, and, and we teach in our Sunday school classes that they were God's remnant because they brought Jesus to us. But there's a second reason why I believe that they were God's remnant. I believe that whenever the church is raptured, I believe, and whether the 144,000 is symbolic or whether it's literal, I believe that there, that, that there will be Jews that will recognize Jesus was the Messiah. And they will be saved. But the church is already gone. But they will come to Jesus Christ and they will receive him and they will start following him. And now we get this picture and it all makes sense. God tells the angels, wait, before I send my wrath, I want you to seal the 144,000. Now, by sealing, we get the picture of the Holy Spirit sealing and, and, and everything. But I see them as being protected, much like the Israelites were protected uh, uh, in the time uh, until they had fulfilled their mission. Now, I believe that many of these 144,000, I believe they will die for their, for, from their faith, for their faith. But at the same time, I do not believe that the plagues, the judgments from God, will have effect on them. Like the Hebrews in Egypt. Like the Hebrews in Egypt. They didn't feel the effects of the plagues. So now picture this with me. Jesus raptures his church. And one by one, there are thousands of Jews that say, well, I guess Jesus was the Messiah. And, and they began crying. The scripture doesn't it say that there are those that they, they start crying. Uh, 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 they start crying for uh, fall, uh, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who will be able to stand? Those 44,000, the Bible says, will be witnesses. 
And I believe that they will be saved at or around the time of the rapture. Any comments any of you have? One thing about the DNA uh, that's prevalent today, uh -huh. as far as finding out what tribe they were from, yeah. it's possible if they get interested, the Jewish people might really get into that and yeah. find out what tribe they're from. Yeah. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? it would and and I can't help but wonder, is this a literal number or is it a symbolic number? Okay, we only have a couple of minutes to, to, to go here, but... Uh, I uh, question. Yeah, sure, Ken. On the 144,000, now we're talking Jewish people here, right? I, I think so. And they're going to be saved during the tribulation. Is that what you're saying? I, I think so. And then they're going to have to go through the seven years if it's right first, right? That's what I've always kind of been taught. They will have to go through it, but, but I really believe, uh, uh, I believe many of them, uh, uh, I believe most of them will end up dying for their faith, okay. but, 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 and so that will be tribulation in and of itself en uh, enough, but, but I, I can't help but wonder, you know, why is God sealing them? Is he sealing them for salvation? Well, we know that's yes. But, but is he sealing them so that they will not feel the effects of the wrath of God? You know, because they're going to get the wrath of man because they're going to be witnessing to mankind and, and uh, mankind's not going to receive it. Now there's going to be non-Jewish people saying too, right? And I believe there will be. There are a few Bible uh, teachers that say, no, the day of salvation is over. But I don't believe that. And, and uh, I, I see Randy behind you uh, 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 affirming. I, I believe, okay, let's go to the early church in Acts. Things were bad for those few thousand people. And the church flourished whenever the heat was on the heaviest. And I believe that, uh, I believe that whenever we get to heaven and that day actually comes and we're able to conceptualize all that's going on. We're going to hear stories uh, uh, about unbelievable revivals uh, that, uh, or souls that were saved because of the witnesses of the 144,000. I believe that. Yeah, Randy? And I think the fifth seal confirms that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I need to really list the tribes they, they left out. Which one did they leave out? Dan. Huh? Dan. Dan. Joseph's in there, but replaced by Manasseh. Uh huh. Yeah. So Joseph's in there, but but uh, yeah. Okay. Good point. I thought there was an issue about the lost tribe of Dan. Well, they moved from where they were supposed to be to the northern part because, well, they didn't believe enough in God that to, to capture where they were at, so they went up north. And yeah. It was easier, but yeah. um, they're lost. Or yeah. And half the tribe of Manasseh was to the east of the Jordan whenever they settled, right? I'm, I'm trying to remember. Half of the tribe of Manasseh on the east side, half on the west side. On the west side, side. yeah, whenever they settled came. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Great questions. Okay. Verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the 24 elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of, the, one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, 
and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, notice this. God, uh, uh, this is usually, we hear this verse read out of Revelation 21. Because it says it again. It says it again. But, but to these that have already made it to heaven, it says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Any questions or comments? Just so you know, there is still a seventh seal. Verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 1 says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And that's where we're going to pick up next week. All right? Any comments? I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being here tonight. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you will bless us as we get ready to depart this place. Lord, thank you for being our God, and thank you for the sweet, sweet spirit in this church. Guide and direct us, I ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.